I'm Alexa Schwerho with Campus Reform. Today, I'm joined by John Saylor, a research associate at the National Association of Scholars. He is sitting down with us today to talk about his recent report, Educating for Citizenship, the Arizona Case Study. The report examines how public schools in the state have turned from teaching American civics and history in place of diversity, equity, and inclusion. John is here to break down these findings and how they impact public schools and higher education. John, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Of course. So to start us off, you know, the report focuses on how schools have somehow replaced American civics and history with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Can you break down what you found in the report, kind of why they're doing this and why they're allowed to do this? Yeah, and that's a great question. So uh, the Arizona system of higher education is governed by uh, in a group called the Arizona Board of, edu- uh, uh, Board of Regents. And the Arizona Board of Regents actually in the last couple of years has taken steps to make civic education more robust. They uh, passed a basic requirement that all universities in the system, and that's three, four, uh, four year major public universities, that all of these universities teach students about American institutions. If you read the content of that requirement, it's actually quite robust. You know, if, if, universities followed this requirement, then it would uh, provide a pretty decent, at least, backdrop for our political debates today. And I think that that would be a really good thing. Unfortunately, what I found in the report is that that's not really what's going on. Most universities in Arizona um, are not following that uh, that requirement very faithfully, and even the ones that do, you know, so for instance, Northern Arizona University did in fact pass uh, a, a kind of establish a new general studies program that includes one course in American institutions that every student has to take, but they also counterbalance that with new coursework and a lot of new coursework Uh, uh, under the broad umbrella of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's really the uh, more remarkable thing that I found, not only in Arizona, but when I've looked at other uh, university systems across the country, it's that uh, universities are increasingly sort of designing their university policy and their curriculum around these concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right. So it seems like they're kind of sprinkling in um, DEI standards and propositions into their curriculum. But how exactly is this going to help students in the long run? What are they preparing these students for? You know, what's interesting is that these requirements that exist, they sound like intuitively something you might want at a university. So you when when you think about going to university or sending your children to university, you think you want them to be exposed to ideas that they haven't Uh, heard about before. You want them to kind of get a breadth of understanding about the world. And so when university administrators propose diversity requirements, often what people think is, oh, okay, you know, I'm going to learn about some other country. I'm going to learn about some other, you know, uh, ostensibly some group of people or some concepts that I wasn't familiar with. And that sounds like at least in, in principle, what you would want at a university, or at least you want some exposure to these kinds of ideas. I think that that's a, that's a good thing. You should be exposed to a, really a broad range of ideas and uh, um, perspectives at, at university. But in practice, these requirements aren't quite that. Instead, uh, let's take Northern Arizona University as an example. At Northern Arizona University, they previously, prior to their updated general studies curriculum required two diversity courses. Uh, It was called global diversity and U.S. ethnic diversity. After their update, which did to their credit include one American institutions course, they said uh, they, they, they essentially had a, a small debate within their liberal studies curriculum committee and their diversity and their uh, uh, diversity curriculum committee asking how much they should expand that diversity category as a requirement for all students. They ended up expanding it from two courses to four courses categories of courses. So now the the categories are U.S. ethnic diversity, global diversity, intersectional identities, and uh, indigenous peoples. Now, what's striking about this uh, is that 
within, uh, um, you know, through the course of that debate, which was documented online in, in uh, curriculum committee notes, the, the diversity curriculum committee essentially said that they expect these courses to be rooted in critical theory. So they said, we're, we don't accept, for instance, foreign language courses as diversity courses because they don't incorporate critical theory, which is something we expect of our diversity courses. And what's interesting about that is that um, the tenets of critical theory are actually very much in vogue in the United States right now. It's very much in vogue to talk about intersectionality, to talk about privilege, to talk about oppression. It's really actually kind of hard to get away from that. So if you want to expose students to diverse perspectives, if you want to expose them to ideas that they probably haven't seen before, requiring four courses that are rooted in critical theory, beyond just the, the kind of absurdity of doing that, the absurdity of requiring a, four required courses to um, espouse a pretty narrow and, and, and I would say problematic ideology, it, it also just doesn't achieve the goal that most people would associate with something like a diversity requirement, which I think shows the fundamental problem with uh, diversity requirements in the first place. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because here at the Leadership Institute's Campus Reform, we have been tracking what states have been banning critical race theory in public schools. There's a bill very similar that would look to ban such content in Arizona schools. So when we have bills like this being passed across the nation, would this impact any DEI standards or requirements that are in place at universities? For the most part, no. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that lawmakers are very and rightly very careful about what kind of content is, or uh, about regulating content in higher education. So K-12 teachers are not protected by the concept of academic freedom. They don't really need to be, uh, your K-12 school is not necessarily supposed to be some sort of marketplace of ideas where there's total unregulated exchange of, of, of concepts. So you, you have a lot more leeway to say, no, you shouldn't just tell students that, uh, that by the, on the basis of their race, they um, ought to, they must feel some sort of guilt or some sort of uh, uh, um, responsibility for past injustices. That, that is kind of a different issue than what's, what, what you can address in higher education. A lot of what's happening in higher education is actually not happening in the classroom at all, it's happening at the level of institutional policy, which actually is a is is the focus of the second half of my report. So the first half of my report focuses on the requirements that uh, um, Arizona universities are not quite following. The second half focuses on the rise of DEI and the way that that's going to um, almost inevitably affect curriculum, but also, you know, pretty much every area. Of, university policy. Um, and the, the way to curtail that is not to go in and try to play whack-a-mole with particular ideas that you say shouldn't be taught. Rather, the way to curtail that is to pass laws that, that um, stem the tide of the DEI bureaucracy. And you can do that in a lot of ways. You can ban mandatory training sessions, uh, which absolutely is something that policymakers should consider. You can, uh, and I think that this is the most important policy to talk about in higher education right now, you can ban mandatory DEI evaluations for tenure, promotion, and hiring, which is happening all across the country right now. Um, and so I would see those as sort of connected to a lot of those uh, um, CRT bans, but it's, it's its own legislative project that needs policymakers to, to kind of um, think creatively and get behind in a different way. Right. And I want to kind of dive into some of what you just talked about in your report. You introduced a number of recommendations that universities can adhere to, such as eliminating DEI statements and requirements. Can you touch and expand a little more on what other actions should be taken? Yeah. So um, uh, the, the, the best way to think about these actions is to, to think about what's going on in the universities right now. Uh, and I found this in Arizona. I found it at other universities across the country as well. So one thing that's happening is the DEI bureaucracy is expanding in just in number and in scope. More people are being hired as diversity officers. 
more policies are being enacted. So now it's pretty common for universities to issue diversity strategic plans or DEI plans or diversity action plans. And it's actually really common for, uh, for individual departments within universities to issue their own plans alongside that. So you have sort of multiple layers of DEI policies being passed down and that affects who gets to teach. So if you're mandating uh, that tenure and evaluation be, uh, you know, look into somebody's contribution to, for instance, social justice, then that's actually going to disqualify some people who don't agree with the mainstream uh, concept of social justice, those people are either going to have to really fly under the radar, which at a certain point doesn't work, and also, you know, there are issues of integrity there, or they're just going to not get the promotion, they're not going to get good evaluations, and more and more you're going to have kind of this mo uh, uh, ideological monoculture that um, eventually will mean that everybody's teaching the same thing and everybody's talking about uh, the, the, the same, you know, the, the same issues, uh, and, and that certainly affects education. I mean, there are also direct ways that these institutional policies affect education when um, the, the diversity action plans call for curricular reviews or course evaluations based on, D, uh, um, you know, based on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So students can, in their course evaluation at the end of the semester, um, evaluate whether their professors were properly attentive to concerns related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the effect of this is that, uh, you know, you, you get kind of the, a total unified uh, outlook on a, a number of political issues. And again, uh, certainly when it comes to the teaching of American history, American civic education, you get a very particular and often very distorted uh, um, regime of teaching for students. So how to, how to curtail that? Well, you need to take aim then at the, at the DEI bureaucracy. And there are a lot of ways that policymakers can do that. I would say um, you, you, you need to look closely at what the DEI bureaucracy does and at, at multiple steps, try to say that you're not uh, really allowed to do that. So I've already mentioned taking away mandatory trainings. And if you do, if you remove mandatory training, suddenly a lot of people who are employed by the DEI bureaucracy really don't have a reason to be there in the first place. Their job is to do these trainings. And if nobody's showing up, then their job is not necessarily justified at all. Um, banning other uh, um, uh, other things along those lines is another important um, step for policymakers to take. But there's also a broader institutional focus that you can take. So the DEI bureaucracy is is so powerful in part because it's basically a group of people within the university who all have um, the same basic interests, and it's also uh, they they have a basic institutional interest. They you, if you have a job and you are a part of an office within a university, you wanna make sure that your office survives, that you wanna make sure that your job continues to get funding. You, um, and, and part of doing that is to just kind of expand the scope of what you do so that uh, uh, you remain relevant and important. And that's why we get DEI bureaucrats regulating just the, the you know, minor perceived infractions uh, that, that um, take place when students say the wrong thing uh, or write the wrong email, or or uh, you know invite people to their to their trap house party. So what to do about that? Well, I I, I think that it's in the interest of anybody who wants to stop this to, to establish a kind of counter bureaucracy. So if there's a bureaucracy within the university that's going to sort of endlessly expand and entail no limiting principle, create a bureaucracy that exists to bolster academic freedom to enforce transparency measures, to enforce limitations on DEI, to enforce concerns of free speech. You have to think not only at the level of kind of curtailing individual bad actions that uh, say these DEI bureaucrats can take, but you also wanna think at the institutional level, what kind of 
countervailing forces can we create to actually promote the things that we want to promote, which is, you know, free speech, academic freedom, uh, due process, and, and other things that are really important, but often neglected in the university. Absolutely. And so just to shift the conversation a little bit, your report has a lot of great information. So can you break down for our viewers how ingrained is DEI in public schools? And more so, do you think that there's any way to kind of shift the culture away from it? So my my report and generally my reporting focuses on on public higher education. And I would say that uh, it, it is exceptionally rare to find a university that does not have uh, an institutional DEI plan. So that's a plan that was most likely created within the last two years, particularly after the summer of 2020, that outlines a number of steps that they're going to, that the university either has already taken or intends to take to uh, uh, align the institution more with the goals and values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that uh, will almost inevitably entail things like increased university programming, so public events where you have, um, you know, that, that are often just optional, where you have speakers come, and those speakers will talk about issues like equity and social justice, um, but also, uh, uh, like I've been talking about, kind of these institutional policies that make it harder for people to object to DEI in the first place. And so to get a good grasp, it's kind of hard to get a good grasp on how prevalent this is, how ingrained it is. But I would say, um, you know, a couple of good, a, a couple of major indicators is that a lot of the institutions that exist as sort of governing bodies that, that are designed to guide universities, for instance, the Arizona Board of Regents, or as I talk about in another report, the Utah System of Higher Education, um, a lot of these institutions also have made these far-reaching commitments to do things like support uh, policies aimed at equity. And now those tend to remain vague, at, at least at the, the highest level. But when you break it down into practice, a lot of what, what tends to happen is you, you tend to get policies that make people, um, that give people, you know, that change the way they teach in the classroom, that change the content that they, that they, they teach, that uh, changes what kind of research gets accepted for, um, you know, gets incentivized and gets advertised uh, and increasingly what kind of research people propose to do in the first place. So I would say, you know, it's, it's really, we have undergone a DEI revolution in, in higher education in this country. So what to do to change things? I mean, that's, that's a massive project, I think. I think that in some ways you have to think really, really big. Um, and uh, uh, it, it has to go beyond even the, the smaller reforms that I suggest. So there are places where you can really say like, no, we're not going to allow uh, DEI evaluations to become the norm. We're not going to allow de mandatory DEI trainings uh, and, and, and things like that. But to affect a broader change in culture, I mean, some of it involves winning debates. You have to, I, I do think that you actually have to change some people's minds. Now, some people will say it's just a matter of changing institutional incentives that really, you know, the reason that people are, are, um, becoming so, for lack of a better term, woke is because uh, there are these sort of bureaucratic incentives this, uh, that might even be traced back to the Civil Rights Act or to uh, amendments to the Civil Rights Act that took place in 1991 or whatever you want to talk about. And, and I think that that's a, a, an important component of what is going, you know, the, uh, of the debate, because those institutional incentives certainly make it so people want to do research that's based on equity. Uh, uh, based on the concept of equity, because if they can do that, if they can say that their research, per, um, you know, is is social justice research, then they get more funding. Or if they can say that their teaching helps social justice, then they get, uh, you know, they can check that box off in their evaluation. So these things, those institutional incentives certainly matter. But even if you take away the institutional incentives, at this point, there are a lot of true believers. There are a lot of people who genuinely think that the unit, that intersectionality is, um, you know, the most important guiding concept for uh, a person in academia to take account of when they're doing research. 
and, and teaching. And at the point in which you get a lot of those people, you really need to, um, you know, at least persuade some group of people who are not yet true believers that this is actually uh, substantively bad. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's enough to totally change things. Uh, I think it's also very helpful to think about creating kind of pockets within major institutions where true and good education that's not distorted by the, the mandates of intersectionality to flourish. Um, and, and to the credit of the University of Arizona, they've, they've take, attempted to do this. Or actually, as a result of policy passed in, uh, by the Arizona legislature, the um, University of Arizona created a center for, for um, uh, uh, civic and economic leadership. And, and that's a place where you genuinely might get some people who, who say, no, our main focus is not going to be these kind of ambiguous concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but our focus is going to be on, um, you know, the classics, on what was in the past considered to be the, 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 the most important part of education. So um, you have to look at the institutional level, you have to look at institutional policy, you have to look at institutional incentives, but you also need to create room for, uh, um, you know, true inquiry to flourish, for, uh, for people to, uh, to be persuaded that these things are not the proper guiding principles for a, for a genuine education. And I have one final question for you here. What do you want people to know about your report or diversity, equity, and inclusion in general? So I would summarize it this way. I would say first, diversity, equity, and inclusion constitute a new civic education. When students go to college, they are more likely at this point to learn about America's history and about what it means to be a citizen, not through a conventional course in American history or American government, even if they receive, uh, uh, um, you know, even if they take those courses, but rather through programming designed to bolster diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that that's, that's really important to understand that DEI has taken over the, the task that um, the, 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 the aim that we have called civic education. But also DEI is um, almost always an inherently politicized project. It, it focuses on the watchwords of identity politics. And finally, increasingly, DEI has become institutional policy. So that means that even at, at, at an increasing number of universities, for a professor to keep their job and to, to be in good standing in their job, they must demonstrate how they have contributed to diversity and equity and inclusion. And I think that those, those things are concerning, but those things are also something that, that uh, you know, good policymaking and people who are aware and active and ready to engage in this debate, I think that those people can actually change things. Absolutely. Well, DEI is an issue. We're definitely going to keep our eye on here at the Leadership Institute's Campus Reform. Thank you so much for coming on today and shining a light on this issue. Thanks for having me.